Amen. Good morning, everyone. We are so thankful and privileged to have Allie and Michael here and McKinley. I mean, really, it wasn't even about Allie and Michael coming. It was, can you please send McKinley over? And if you guys have to come too, it's okay. I'm kidding. But we're privileged to have them here. And Michael is going to speak here in a little bit. But there's something that I want to do first. Because there's someone else that I'm very thankful for being here. Someone who came over from Nigeria. Right? Derek came over as well. Derek came over to see some doctors. Derek came over in a lot of pain. He was in the emergency room all day yesterday until late last night in incredible pain. And you see he's here this morning. That's incredible. I'm thankful for that because that's what a warrior is. That's what a warrior does. And it didn't link with me until communion, a dream that I had three nights ago for what he wants me to do this morning over Derek. So Derek, would you come forward? I'm going to just pray over you. And then we'll have Michael come up. If you need to lean on this like I usually do, then go right ahead. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to pray over my brother here. And you all can pray in unity and spirit with me. I'm going to anoint you first. Sorry, I'm shaking like crazy this morning. In Jesus' name. It's a good thing this is a roll-on, otherwise it'd just spill all out. <laughs> That's why I got roll-ons, right? <laughs> Although that's, that'd be okay too, right? If it just spilled out. Yeah, man. Father, I thank you for Derek. I thank you for his heart for you. I stand here in agreement with your will for his life. In agreement with his heart that is sold out for you. I thank you that he lives in a world he does not see, as your angels do. They only see what is in front of them. But Derek sees what you have shown him by faith. That is his sight. Father, I stand here in agreement with his sight, in agreement with his heart. Father, he sees the battlefield. In fact, he walks on the battlefield. He engages at every turn. Over the time that I have known him, I have never seen him stopped. No matter what he went through, he always sought his refuge in you and his trust in your son. So Lord, in obedience... I do pray this over him in Jesus' name. I command this spirit, this spirit of infirmity, I see you. I see you. The Lord has said you will be hunted you will be found. 
and you will be slaughtered. I speak this in Jesus' name. I command this spirit of infirmity destroyed in Jesus' name. This spirit of infirmity that has come into his kidneys, has come into his bladder, has come into that part of his system to wreak havoc, to bring pain, to attempt distraction. I crush you in the name of Jesus Christ and in the blood which he spent on the cross paying for your very death. I break all curses and witchcraft as these demonic spirits so often are summoned through that witchcraft. I break it in Jesus' name. I crush it in Jesus' name. I bind and I cast to the abyss all demonic spirits that have been conjured up and associated with those curses or witchcraft in Jesus' name. And I release a warring angel, a hunting angel. Draw your sword and go after the very human or Nephilim spirit that sent those curses in Jesus' name. Father, I ask for wholeness in his digestive tract, wholeness in his kidneys, wholeness in the workings, even, Father, with everything or anything that has been produced through this spirit of infirmity, I ask it gone in Jesus' name. I command it dismantled in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, pour freedom into his body. Freedom from pain. Freedom from anything that is not your plan. We trust you for this. In my dream, you said to speak in confidence. I speak this in absolute confidence. Because your will be done. We worship you. We praise you. I declare all of this in the name of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, my Savior, our Messiah, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Hey, guys. How are you? Thank God for every one of you for responding to that question. That's awesome. I don't, I don't like talking to like a brick wall, <clears throat> so that's really awesome. Uh, I like it to be a little interactive with a little bit of a boundary, right? It has to, the show has to go on, if you will. Um, so, yeah, for, I, I don't know if everybody in here has, I've met everybody in here. So, so my name is Michael Burton. Um, my wife and I, my wife's Allie, the beautiful lady in the back. Um, we're the international directors for Ignition 633 Ministries. We're the leaders on the ground in Nigeria. If I haven't met you, nice to meet you. Um, for the, the past two months, God has really laid something really heavy on my heart, a topic, topics. And I'll just go ahead and say it's, it's kingdom leadership and kingdom stewardship. And these, these pieces have been laid really heavy on my heart, but I've also noticed throughout the various Bible studies that we have going on in Nigeria, um, through different speakers, different things I've attended, even, even uh, YouTube clips of other pastors that you just come across, this topic seems to be something that is really spirit-driven, um, you know, across the board. 
And I think it's indicative of even the times that we're in and the things that uh, this current and upcoming season are really going to require from us more so than what they have required before. And um, so the Lord's had me kind of explore this more deeply, um, put together a lot of notes, because what I have this morning in notes and just the points that I want to I bring across and share that the Lord's given me, I, I don't even think is even a, a, a really big percentage of all there is to these things, right? So I, I want to just pray really quick before we get started, and I, I, we have a lot of scripture and a lot of things to just kind of talk through. Um, I'm praying we can make it to lunch and it doesn't last till dinner. Father, I thank you so much. I thank you so much for all that you do for us. I thank you for every opportunity that you give us within your kingdom to, to, to just bring forth an establishment of enthroning your son, Jesus Christ, as king on this earth. God, I thank you for each and every one of the people here and online. God, I thank you for our team in Nigeria and all the hard work that they put in day in and day out, including today, Father, with everything that's going on. I thank you for our campus pastor, Pastor Kay. I thank you, God, for, for all the leaders there in, in both the, the organizations and companies and also just in our American leadership and all of it, God. I just thank you for the hearts of the people that, that you've called here. Lord, I do ask that you would help organize the thoughts that you've given me, and although I've given and written a lot of notes, God, take over. Reorder it, rewrite it. God, do whatever you want, Lord, and, and I just ask that you would fill my mouth, uh, completely organize and fill my mind, God, and that you would, you would release a portion of your Holy Spirit here this morning that would assist us in digesting individually everything that is released this morning. God, because it applies differently to different people, and God, you know what each one of us needs, including myself. Each time I've researched, each time I've talked about this in conversation or in messages, God, there is something new you have helped me to digest and understand in my own life. God, I just asked that this morning, and I praise you, and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so I want to go ahead and turn to Matthew 25. Let's just go right into Scripture. Matthew chapter 25. We'll start in verse 1. <clears throat> so, I'm just going to read through this here. I'm, I'm reading out of the Amplified version. I don't know uh, if you guys are putting it up on the screen, but I'm reading out of the Amplified. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, thoughtless, silly, careless, and five were wise, far-sighted, practical, and sensible. For when the foolish took their lamps, they did not take any extra oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delayed, they all began to nod off, and they fell asleep. But at midnight, there was a loud shout that said, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. Then all those virgins got up and put their own lamps in order, trimmed the wicks, added oil, and lit them. But the foolish virgins said to the wise, give us, give us some of your oil, because our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, otherwise there won't be enough for all of us, <clears throat> or for us, and for you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy oil for yourselves. But while they were going away to buy oil, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut and locked. Later, the others also came and said, Lord, Lord, open up the door for us. But he replied, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, I do not know you. We have no relationship. Therefore, be on the alert, be prepared and ready, for you do not know the day nor the hour when the Son of Man will come. So I want to I look at this just briefly here, and 
just kind of in plain English, kind of break it down, paraphrase it for a moment, okay? The picture here is that you've got uh, 10 people who, who go out, 10, 10 virgins who are going out to, you know, go and see the bridegroom. Bridegroom is, so they, so they go out, half of them are prepared. They, are, they, they, they have foresight. They understand what it's going to take, and, and maybe it might take a little extra, and they don't exactly know. So they, they really prepare themselves because they see a value that they don't want to miss. And so they will prepare everything in their power, bring everything that, that they have in their care to ensure that this is done, right, that, that they see um, this through. While the others were careless, thoughtless, didn't really think much about it. And so they, you know, they grabbed their lamp, maybe they put a little oil in, and they thought, well, yeah, this is cool. It would be really cool to see them. Let's, let's just go. They didn't really think about the rest of it. So, you know, Jesus here is making the comparison of preparedness for when, for when the Son of uh, God returns, right? The Son of Man. So it's... This is one particular aspect that I wanted to start off with in terms of stewardship of our own resources, managing what's, what's within us. I want to keep going here into verse 14. For it is just like a man who was about to take a journey, and he called his servants together and entrusted them with his possessions. To one he gave five talents which talents are just a portion or a measure of money, right? Five talents. To to another, two talents, and to another, one, each according to his own ability. And then he went on his journey. The one who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them. And he made a profit and gained, gained five more. So he doubled it into ten talents. Verse 18, but the one who had received, excuse me, verse 17, likewise, the one who had had two made a profit and gained two more. But the one who had received one went and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Verse 19, now after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. And the one who had received the five talents came and brought uh, him five more saying, Master, you entrusted me to five talents. See that I've made a profit and gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful and trustworthy over a little. I will put you in charge of many things. Share in the joy of your master. Also, the one who had two talents came forward saying, Master, you have entrusted me two talents. See, I've made a profit and gained two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful and trustworthy over a little. I will put you in charge of many things. Share in the joy of your master. Verse 24, the one who had received one talent also came forward saying, master, I knew you to be harsh and demand a demanding man, reaping the harvest where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid to lose the talent, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is your own. But the master answered him, you wicked, lazy servant. You knew that I reap the harvest where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter seed. Then, <clears throat> then you ought to have put the money with the bankers, and at my return I would have received my money back with interest. So take the talent away from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has and values his blessings and gifts from God and has used them wisely, more will be given. And he will will be richly supplied so that he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, because he has ignored or disregarded his blessings and gifts from God, even what he has what he does have will be taken away. So I'm going to stop there. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm discussing the topics of kingdom stewardship and kingdom leadership, right? And I want, to, I want to really lay in that I'm saying kingdom stewardship and kingdom leadership because there is stewardship that's poor. 
There is leadership that's bad. I'm sure anyone who's had a number of years in a workforce with multiple leaders, you've experienced some good ones and some bad ones, right? Um, I'm sure that in your own life or in looking at others, uh, you've seen some good stewardship and some bad stewardship, right? Thank you. Thanks for filling the time. Um, <clears throat> what is kingdom stewardship? Kingdom stewardship is the responsibility and privilege given to believers to manage and utilize the resources, talents, time, and opportunities entrusted to them by God for the advancement of His kingdom. When you talk about or think about leadership and stewardship in His kingdom, you have to have first a goal, a purpose, right? You have to have been given a, a plan or a vision because you can steward something poorly or extremely well and it be the exact same procedure that you did because it depends on what you were stewarding it towards. If you are stewarding your finances to have the biggest abundance of savings, not spending money where you shouldn't spend it is good stewardship. If your goal is to build a project that you've been asked to do, spending all of the money to get it done is good stewardship. Am I correct? So it's the, it's the same uh, you know, type of thing. <clears throat> it depends on your goal and purpose, right? Um, we are called to produce always. We're called to produce always. It's not a question of, you know, today, let me, let me ask the Lord if I'm called to produce. I think if you asked yourself the question and you asked the question of the Lord, Lord, do you want me to bring gain to your kingdom today? You think he's going to answer and say, nah, take the day off. It's all good. You know, don't, don't worry about that. Now, it's not the same thing, by the way, as saying you can never have rest. Rest isn't the, the pause or absence of doing something, right? Rest is an aspect of your, your trust. And I think Bryn has, has even preached about this, right? Or maybe we just talked, but I think you preached about this. Um, this has been a concept that is really well explained by Bryn. I, I really enjoyed the, the, the lesson and, and interpretation of that. And, but rest is a combination of multiple things. It's trust and surrender you know, to, to what the Lord has, right? It is the essence of what Matthew 6 um, you know, the portion, I think it starts in verse 25 or so, you know, where it ends in Matthew 6.33, our banner verse. It's, it's, you know, seek ye first the kingdom, worrying about all the other stuff, not at all, because God knows, you know, what you need. Um, <clears throat> our choices in stewardship are not to produce or not produce, right? That's not the choice that we're being asked to do. It's which of the choices before us, which of the options before us that we have to make a choice for, produce the highest gain for his kingdom according to his, his will and his value, right? So, you know, like in an example for me, um, you know, you, you think about lots of things that, that you know, sometimes we, we can do it, sometimes we can't. You, you look at things like the prayer call. Not everybody can be on the prayer call every single day. Um, you know, I, I can't. I can't be on the prayer call every single day with various things that happen. But every single day, I have, well, let me, let me rephrase that. I can be on the prayer call every single day. I can be physically. But each and every day, I'm given a choice of whether to get on or not. And my choice isn't exactly whether I get on or I don't get on. My choice is between getting on and the other options that I have, which one brings the greatest gain for his kingdom? If it's getting on the prayer call versus, you know, watching a movie with my family who I haven't seen in two weeks because of traveling and doing something and they just, they do need my presence and focus in that time, okay, maybe God is leading you that that is the greater gain for his kingdom. Maybe it's that you have been up sick in pain, you know, like, like Derek has been past, past whatever, and that he actually found himself able to possibly go and get sleep, 
you know, that may be something God's asking you to do for a gain for his kingdom, to bring healing over the body. I can't tell you what, what the greater gain for his kingdom is in your choice set. I can't. I can only say that for myself. Sorry. But it's not a choice of whether we produce or don't produce, right? And what I mean by produce isn't works. Good works are a fruit and, and produce things, but producing is, it, it's exactly what it is, bringing gain to his kingdom, bringing something to his kingdom. That is being productive. That is producing. Christ didn't die on the cross so that we can go relax and binge watch on Netflix this, you know, series that we probably shouldn't even be watching to begin with, you know, for a week straight, right? Like he didn't die on the cross for us to do that. He died on the cross for us to do something productive for his kingdom. Watching, you know, oh, I'm not even going to go there. <clears throat> you have to have a goal and a purpose, right? So, so I have four principles that I kind of culminated and, and put down that are principles of stewardship, right? Kingdom stewardship. The first is the principle of ownership. And I want, I want to go to First Chronicles chapter 29. First Chronicles chapter 29. Oops. We'll start in verse 11. So verse 11 says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and on earth, yours is the dominion and kingdom, O Lord. And you exalt yourself as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand is power and might, and it is in your hands to make great and to give strength to everyone. So, first principle is the principle of ownership, okay? If we don't have down in our lives that, because we just talked about stewardship being the management and, and you know, what I say, management, the, the utilization of everything within our our capacity to do it. God has given us, you know, a job, money, you know, different things. If, if stewardship is the management of all those resources, if, if we don't understand principally that the real owner of all of that, including our very lives, is God, we just might as well quit now, right? You can't do anything else without first recognizing that we're not even the real owners. We're, we're leasing this stuff, you know, we're, we're renting it from the Lord. He, he's given us a lease on these things. He's given it to us, just like in the examples of this stewardship, he's, he's given us charge of it to, to manage his possessions and his things. If we don't recognize that, we're not going to get the rest correctly. <clears throat> it's going to be off. We're going to go down different paths that, that shouldn't be there in our thought processes and, and make decisions based on wrong paradigms and wrong lenses, right? Um, if we don't recognize that our job that we have is given to us by God, well, first of all, if you're only there just, you know, you're not there because God told you to be there, you might want to have a conversation with him, right, in, in reality, our job that we have been given on this earth has been given to us by God if we've answered a call to go there, right? Some of us may have jobs that aren't called by God. You know, I'm, no, I'm not going to go there either. <clears throat> Some of us may have jobs, and I'm not talking about just in this room. I'm talking about online. Some of us in this world have jobs that aren't called by God to be there, right? Um, like, like Biden. Uh, I'll go there. 
Yeah, there. <clears throat> so, if you don't think that God is the one that gave you the job or has given you the money that you have, you're going to start making decisions based off of what you feel you have and what you feel is yours. And you're going to go super protective over something that's not yours to protect. Does that make sense? You're going to be super insecure, even though the falsehood is that you're trying to secure it. You're going to be super insecure in your job because you're going to be worried about, oh, if I do this, if I stand up to this, you know, gay pride month they're doing and I take a stand, then, then you know, I could lose my job. And then how am I going to provide for your family? Shut up. You're not the one providing for your family. You didn't own it. God owns it. So stop, stop thinking that way, right? And, and you know, as much as I'm going to stand here and I'm going to preach and it's going to sound, you know, good and whatever, like I'm assessing this stuff in my life. No one's absent from this temptation. No one is absent or exempt from this temptation. We, we are constantly tempted to feel like these things are ours because that's an easier form in the society of communication. Oh, my job. It's, it'd be much more difficult, I promise you, to start conversations with all your friend groups and be like, well, this job that God gave me, you know, to, to just steward, it's not really my job, but God's asked me to do this. I mean, we can talk about that. We can say that, but not, not to everybody and it go kind of smooth, right? So we use this language like my job and, you know, my kids and, and they are, but, but, you know, you get my point. Because we use that language for the ease of society, we become so tempted to really actually feel. It's like, you know, if you, it, it, I, I remember in sixth grade, I had this math teacher, Miss Tillotson, if you're watching, thank you very much for your input in my life. She used to say, she used to say, I'll never forget it. She used to say, if you, because we'd be in math class, it was difficult, it was challenging. I don't know what it was. Hopefully it wasn't two plus two, because that's not challenging. Um, in sixth grade. So... <laughs> She is, she, some kids were just struggling, and I remember, you know, somebody saying, like, I'm just, I'm just stupid. You know how you self-implode when things don't go your way or you struggle? You just like, you know, oh, I'm just stupid. And she would constantly ensure to stop the entire class and make that the focal point at that time and say, do not say that. If you keep saying you're stupid, you'll become stupid. Right? You are self-prophesying over yourself. Now, maybe, I don't know, Ms. Tillotson, maybe you knew that, maybe you didn't, that it was self-prophecy at the time. I mean, we were probably too young to understand that, so that's why it wasn't explained in that manner. But regardless, it's a good principle. Right? If we continue to say these things, we, we are tempted to then become that. Right? And I'm not trying to preach on don't say they're your kids. You know, that wouldn't bode well when Child Protective Services comes around or something. These aren't even my kids, Lord. You know, it doesn't work. But my point is, we have to have a, a posture and an understanding that truly it's in God's hands. Not in our hands, it's in God's hands. They're his possessions and he's asked us to utilize these things for the purpose of bringing gain to his kingdom. To utilize, right? To utilize. I want to sink that in one more time. To utilize. When you start looking at everything on how you can use it, you don't normally think about how you're going to use your kids, right? <laughs> like, probably not a good way to start. But for his kingdom, how do you use your kids for the greatest gain of his kingdom, right? How do you use that? Teach them. Teach them in the way they should go so they don't depart from it. Because then God has however many kids you have, that many more warriors. Yeah. Am I right? Um, <clears throat> so ownership, principle of ownership. You don't own it. You don't own anything. You're broke. He's rich. Yeah. Right? Principle number two is principle of responsibility. And I am, on the principle of ownership, I am going to throw Matthew 6.33 in there, not like just a throwing it in there. I think it's thrown into everything because I just firmly believe I've not found a time or a teaching or a thing that doesn't, at its root and core, go back to the Matthew 6.33 baseline, you know, scripture. Matthew 6, where, where they talk about all this, talks about, look, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the true owner, the real owner 
on what you should do, how you should do it, how much you can get, you know, whatever. You're not seeking him for those reasons, but you are seeking him because he's the one that will provide anything you need for what he's asked you to do. If he has asked you to, if he has asked you to, um, you know, build a house for your family, it is not your stinking responsibility to go out and find the highest paying job to make sure you get it done in a certain timeline. It's your opportunity to be seeking him every day, like the principle of the manna. Don't live on the manna that was provided day one. I mean, literally in that, in that entire, you know, scriptural example, it says the manna fell from heaven. So God provide, God's the owner of the food. They didn't make that bread or manna. Is it bread? Yeah, it's bread. Yeah, something. They didn't make that manna. Isaac, you're Jewish. Come on. <clears throat> they didn't make that manna. They didn't make that manna. They didn't own it. It was provided for them. And what, what was asked of them? Go get what you need for the day. Do not take extra So for tomorrow. Go fresh and get yours tomorrow. Now, I'm very much paraphrasing. It's probably not exactly said like that in Scripture. Take it, you know, with a creative license. Go get what you need and I'll provide it for you tomorrow what you need. And even in the, even in the scripture, it, it, it gave an example, at least one example, where somebody went and got extra for tomorrow so they didn't have to go out again for tomorrow. What happened? When they woke up, it was spoiled rotten. I go, southern there, spoiled. Spoiled rotten. Spoiled for you northerners, right? <clears throat> or for those in Nigeria, spoilt. Spoilt. <clears throat> I... I think so many times we do that, though, because we, we receive an instruction from the Lord, like, you know, like, uh, whatever. Alexis used this analogy a long time ago, a couple of years ago. It's just stuck with me. Like, every time I've ever talked about this stuff, it just comes out because it's just such a great example. You know, if, if God asked me or told me, prophesied to me that, that I am going to, he, I'm going to win a, a what, a 5K marathon or whatever it is, the really big one where you got to run and swim and bike and, you know, fly and all this stuff, then I'm going to win one, right? <clears throat> well, if I took that manna from today that he gave me and then also applied it to tomorrow, I'm going to win one. Okay, and then the next day I'm going to win one. Awesome. Well, Lord, I trust you. I'm going to win one. I'm going to win one. By the time that, you know, six months rolls around and it's time for the 4K, man, I'm going to be disappointed. I'm really going to, I'm really going to question God. Like you said I was going to win. He's like, did you come get the manna the next day where I told you to go start practicing and working out and getting into shape? Did you come to me the week later when I told you to start, you know, doing half of that to, to really test your endurance? Did you, did you, you know, do this? So <clears throat> it's important that we, we understand, you know, the true owner is God. God's the one that provides. He's the one who, who we need to seek. Principle number two, the principle of responsibility. I want to turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke 12. Uh, Luke 12, verse 42. This is the parable of the faithful steward. <clears throat> Luke 12, 42. Uh, the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise steward of the estate whom his master will put in charge over his household to give his servants their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed, happy, prosperous to be admired is that servant whom his master finds so doing when he arrives. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is taking his time in coming and begins to beat the servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day where he does not expect him and at an hour that he doesn't know and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers." Verse 47, and that servant who knew his master's will and yet did not get ready or act in accord with his will will be beaten with many lashes of the whip. But the one who did not know it and did things worthy of a beating, he will receive only a few lashes. 
from every uh, yeah from everyone to whom much has been given much will be required and to whom they entrusted much of him they will ask all the more so just to point out one thing that's not really exactly part of this there this also talks about the accountability of of knowledge right when something has been revealed to you or shown to you by god or through a sermon and a truth something being revealed to you you're held to account by that this is this is it right here the one who knew better is going to get beaten severely the one who did the same thing but he just didn't know he's still going to be beaten but he's going to have a lot more grace with that right <clears throat> but i want to look at this about the parable, or excuse me, the, the principle of responsibility, right? The principle of responsibility is recognizing and acting, right? Recognizing and acting on the weight of God's generosity. Recognizing and acting on the weight of God's generosity. Um, <clears throat> Greg, let's... Allie and I and McKinley stay at their house, you know, um, when we come back here. And um, I'm quite certain, well, one, thank you. It's very generous. So I want to make that known. I know we've told you before, but I want to say it again so that everybody recognizes that that's not just like an obligation. It's a generosity, right? It's a generosity. I'm quite certain that if we went in and never cleaned up anything after ourselves, broke everything we touched, took crayons and allowed Kinley to draw all over the walls and never did anything to stop it or clean it up, you know, because it may happen and that's not a problem. But if we just like, oops, oh well, and move on, quite certain we wouldn't have that generosity extended to us again. Am I right? <laughs> amen. Yeah, strong Amen. <laughs> But we clean, best of our ability, right? We clean and we steward it well. We take responsibility for their generosity and the weight of their generosity because next time we come back, we'd like to not have to spend money on a hotel, right? I'd like to, I'd like to be able to stay there for free, right? But we have to recognize the responsibility. If, if Rich, if all the Bible study people came over and just trashed your house on Bible study night, I mean, just water bottles everywhere, and man, I hope I'm not stepping on a live situation here, guys, so y'all better shape up, <laughs> but <clears throat> they trash your house with water bottles and, and never clean up, and there's tissues everywhere, and you know, they're constantly tipping over chairs on their way out, or you know, not taking their shoes off after walking through your front yard after it rained with mud all over it and just tracking through the house, you might want to reconsider allowing the Bible study at your house, right? You might think about it. We have responsibility in stewardship. We have to recognize the weight of God's generosity in our life, the fact that he gave you that job, the fact that he gave you the opportunity for that to gain that money or to the money he just gave you, however it is. We have to recognize the responsibility or the weight of the, the generosity in God. I mean, I'll tell you one, I recognize the weight of the responsibility of God's generosity with our child McKinley. And, and, I mean, because Allie and I, many of you know the story, we tried for five years, or I think it was close to five years, and we're not able to have a child. Uh, it just was not happening, and we couldn't figure it out. I mean, it, it really burdened us those last two years. I mean, really burdened us. Um, made sad our hearts, you know, everything, and God's generosity in, in giving us something that we did desire, you know, but it's also something that is within our realm of responsibility. There's a weight to that generosity. It's not a generosity so we can just raise her up however we want to raise her. It's to raise her up in the way that she should go, right? So that she doesn't depart from it, so that she becomes a warrior for God's kingdom. And <clears throat> so we have that responsibility, the principle of responsibility. Three, principle of accountability, right? Um... Romans 14, 12, you don't have to turn there, I'm just going to read it. Romans 14, 12 says, So then each of us will, will give an account of himself to God. It's just a point blank, each of us are accountable to God, himself. I'm not accountable with Greg, 
on a decision that I made that I asked his input in. It was my decision to make, so I'm accountable alone for the decision, right? Everything that we do, I'm accountable in the end for the fact that I raised McKinley up to, you know, I don't know. I'm not even going to prophesy anything bad. She's going to be perfect. Um, <laughs> but if there was a poor, you know, thing that she was walking down and we were training her up to do this or that, trained her up to lie or something, you know, just lie to everybody. I'm accountable for that. And more so, leading a child. Um, there's also this, this understanding of accountability when, when, and this is why leadership and, and vision is so important. I mean, Proverbs 29, 18 says, if, if, when the people don't see what God's doing, this is, I think, the message translation that I really like, when people don't see what God's doing, they stumble all over themselves. But, but when they, I when they, uh, can't remember exactly what it said. Let me just read this real quick. <clears throat> Proverbs 29, 12, or 29, 18, it says, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. So it, it's the same as like a, a building design. Greg knows well. We know in Nigeria. Gabe knows very well because we're building a lot of buildings. We have a lot of projects going on. And if Greg, <laughs> I don't really want to think about this, but if Greg were to call me and say, hey, I need you to build this building that's going to be this multi-purpose center and it needs to, you know, have a hall downstairs and some office space and a big commercial kitchen upstairs. I need you to get right on that. I'm like, yes, sir. You know, that I wouldn't even walk in that building because I don't know how to do that, right? I don't, I don't have a clue of a vision on how to do that type of thing. But if he gives me the drawings, the architectural plans... The, the concepts of what it needs to be and where the foundational pillars need to go and all of this stuff, I then know how to not stumble all over myself, right? And cause people to die when they go in the building and it collapses. <laughs> but I don't stumble all over myself trying to figure this out. But when I attend to the plan that he's given me, then, then I'm blessed. I'm prof I prosper in this project, right? And <clears throat> when, you, when you look at something like that, you also see that there's an ability or a measure of accountability that happens because if he's gone during the entire project build and I finish it and I'm standing here proud, yes, I have done it, you know. And he comes over and he takes the plans. There is an ability to look at this plan and look at the fruition of what we actually did and say, Michael, <laughs> dude, were you looking at this plan upside down? That pillar is sideways. How does it support anything if it's supposed to be, you know, and he's able to hold me or the project accountable. If you have a vision and a calling on your life, such as if you're called to be a missionary, you, there's an accountability with that. If you see that vision, that calling on you, if you have a calling on your life to do X, Y, Z, that plan, that vision, you're able to to see and you are held accountable to what that vision, what the fruition, what you did versus what the plan was. And in the end, that's what we're all held accountable for. There's a book, the Bible says, that's written about us before we were ever, uh, I think, even conceived. And it has a plan for what God intended for our lives. It's the blueprints for our very stewardship of our lives, every, everything that God desires us to do. And in the end, when we finished building what it is, is our life, he's going to do that very thing. He's going to take that book and he's going to look at what you actually did and we're going to look and have some accountability with this, right? Um, so we are, there's a principle of accountability with stewardship. Um, final principle is the principle of reward. And this principle of reward is, is just that We've read it a couple times. I'm not going to turn back to Scripture right now, but we've read it where it says to, to you know, if you stewarded well what you were given, more will be given, right? And, and so there's the principle of a consequence, a reward. We, we hope it would be a reward and not a punishment, but regardless, it's a consequence. In stewardship, there are consequences of how you steward. If you steward well, you're going to be trusted with more. If, <clears throat> if, uh, if I had a car um, and I wanted it to stay here, and I'm constantly gone in Nigeria, and I handed it over to Isaac and asked Isaac, hey, 
can you just keep my car for me? You know, I just want to make sure nobody steals it or anything like that. Just keep my car for me. I, um, while I'm in, this, in Nigeria, when I come back, I'll be able to use it. He says, yeah, no problem, no problem. If every time I come back, no matter what condition I leave it in because of the hastiness of needing to get on the plane or get to the airport or whatever, I come back and it's like detailed, it's waxed, it's vacuumed. You know, everything is pristine, better than, I've, than I left it. I am literally going to ask him to do everything for me. You know, keep this. Oh, who, 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 can, who can do this? Oh, he could do it well. Yeah, he could do it well. But if I come back and all of a sudden there's like a big old scratch down the side of the car that definitely wasn't there when I, when I left the car, which this didn't happen because I don't have a car right now. But, you know, if that was the way it was left, guess how many more times I'm going to ask him to do that? Not unless it's somebody I don't like's car that I'm asking him to, to do, Right? It's just not going to happen. So there's consequences of good and poor stewardship in, in our lives. Um, I also want to tackle this, this idea, and I don't want to... Hmm. I don't want to step on toes with this, but if, your toes are tep- if, you, if your toes are stepped on, like move your feet. Um, but there is this thing, and I, I'm... I'm right there with it. Uh, it's a phrase that I often used to say too. And, um, and, and I do believe that most people I've heard say this, I, I do believe that there is a understanding of the truth behind what it really means. Um, but I want to distinguish this because not everybody might. There is, in a lot of conversations, I myself have said this and I know others have said this in conversation where it's like, well, I didn't really feel led to do this, right? I didn't really feel led to do this. I didn't want to do it in my own striving, in my own strength. That is true that you don't want to strive in your own strength. You want to be led of the Lord to do something. But I do want to distinguish one piece of this when it comes to stewardship, Um, just because the Lord isn't directly telling or leading you to do this particular thing, whether it be getting on this prayer call, whether it be going to this meeting or conference, whether it be, you know, opening your Bible, whatever the item may be that's, that is in front of you, just because the Lord didn't specifically lead you or, or tell you to do it does not mean that it's still not a, something you should do right? And it also doesn't mean just because the Lord didn't specifically tell you to do this, that it's striving in your own strength. Striving in your own strength has, has to do with doing something for your own personal motivations and gain and, and thought processes, right? Um, <clears throat> I... It's easier to tell when you're striving in your own strength or doing something whether God wants you to do it or not. Or, I mean, doing something because God wants you to do it or trying to decipher whether it's just because I want to do it when it's not something you desire to do, right? Like, I don't want to go to, uh, I don't know, I definitely don't want to go to a Miley Cyrus concert. Not that God would ever ask me to do that, but if he did, it'd be really clear to understand that I'm, if I'm feeling led to go there, that, that it would be the Lord asking me to, which he's, he wouldn't. That's a really bad example. I apologize, but couldn't think of anything else on the, on the fly. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. It, it, John went through this. He knows what I'm talking about. He didn't want to go to a certain, not Miley Cyrus, though, you know. But... Just because God isn't directly telling us to do this particular thing doesn't mean that it's not something we should do. And it doesn't mean that we're striving if we do it. That comes from the heart. It comes from the motivations. It comes from the intentions of why we're doing something. If you are getting on the prayer call because it's 8.30 or what time is the morning one? We're way off in Nigeria. 6 a.m. here. If you're just getting on because it's 6 a.m., or maybe you know how to check the app and see who's on, and you quickly preview who's on to see if they would know that you're on or not, and that's your decision of whether to get on or not, right? Like, maybe it happened. It's, you know, I will admit it's happened to me in the past, right? 
If that's your intention of getting on, don't get on. You're striving in your own strength. But it doesn't, it doesn't make it not something that God may want you to do. And I can't, I can't, nobody can decide that for you. Those, those are decisions for yourself. But I want to distinguish the language from the truth and intention behind what is communicated. That's why I said I don't believe many people that I've heard, heard say those terms here. I know they know this. But just like I said at the beginning where it's like, well, my kids and my job, sometimes we're tempted to kind of, it kind of glosses over for a moment and we get a little bit off in our thought processes on that, right? So I just want to distinguish those things. <clears throat> there are also times that not doing something specifically and on purpose that would be viewed, it, it, it seems counterintuitive. Um, okay, there was, a, there was a leader in Nigeria that we, we promoted um, from within ranks. He started off on a very low-level position, and we promoted him to the level of manager of a certain department, and he was over a few, a few people. And in this, he took over something that I was pioneering. So I had been leading these people, trying to cultivate them into the understanding of this and that. I'm not being specific because they, they do watch. Trying to cultivate them to a certain level of competence and just trying to pioneer this department or whatever we're doing, right? And eventually it got to a point where someone was identified as cultivated enough to the point where they stewarded their own decisions and how they worked and their work ethic to the point where they needed to be given charge over this. And in that, I could, I had a choice to still be part of these meetings or not be part of these meetings, right? Because I still have an input in, in, these, in that level. It's just fresh. But purposefully, I chose not to be there in those meetings because the gain for God's kingdom or the gain for that organization or the gain that would be, would be um, cultivated there was the establishment of his leadership, right? With me there, I am the clear leader. I have been the leader. That has been established. I walk into the room and they, you know, have you ever been in a conversation where like, uh, you know, you're trying to, you're hosting this conversation. You've not really ever been the leader, but the former leader or another really established leader is like in the room and you're the one leading and asking questions. And when you ask the person the question, they answer looking at that other leader. It happens. And, and sometimes the removal of that other established leader helps to establish this leader. So, so I'm only pointing these things out because I want the Holy Spirit to digest for each and every one of you what it means um, in your decision making on how you steward your choices in your life, right? <clears throat> if, if you are looking at... You may go to next Sunday. Um, <clears throat> if you're looking at things in your life and decisions in your life, it, everything, everything is for the gain of his kingdom. Absolutely everything. It's easy for us to look at things and, and say that, well, this decision doesn't matter. I promise you that your choice of what you wear actually has an impact on his kingdom. If you are a female and you decide to wear something that shows half of your body that shouldn't be shown, um, it has an impact, whether it be good or bad. It has an impact in his kingdom. If you are deciding, um, you know, the very consequence for your child, whether to beat them senselessly or give them grace, has an impact for his kingdom. You have to steward everything for the greatest gain of his kingdom. And, and I know that it can feel, it, it did for me as I'm just talking with the Lord and, and he's like showing me this level of importance on this. It can get really overwhelming when it comes down to like, you mean the, the shoes that I put on have an impact? I mean, maybe, maybe not, right? If, if the shoes you wear are going to cause you to lose your foot for some reason, you know, that has an impact on his kingdom. But every choice that you make you can look and you can see positive or negative consequences for his kingdom. And I don't want to over-spiritualize something. In fact, I want to tell you that nothing can be over-spiritualized. Everything is spiritual. 
that reality and that realm is more real than the realm we're in. This one is temporary, right? Like the whole point of this entire thing, timeline, is to get back there, right? It's to get back there. Now, you know, whatever. No, it's not our responsibility. God's going to do it. Whatever. You can argue with me later. It's, it's just the entire intention is to get out of this dying, decaying, you know, cursed world of creation and get back to the kingdom, right? Get back to Christ. And, you know, the establishment of his kingdom here, rather. Let me me rephrase that. It's not going to his kingdom. It's bringing his kingdom here. And um, we we really do, I want to challenge each one of you, we really do need to start looking at the finer details of things. We need to start looking at those finer details, what you watch on television, right? Because I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say that, and some people in this room have been in other people's houses or have watched what other people have watched or come to know through conversation what another person watches. And you're going to possibly start to judge, like, ooh, that person watches this stuff. I don't know. You know, that's, that's real violent or that's real, you know, that's filled with curse words or that's, you know, this or that's that. Look, that, you do you. You're responsible for what God's asking you to do. I I will tell you, God has asked me at times to watch something that would ordinarily be deemed in the Christian realm as not a good choice. You know, something that has, you know, Hollywood demonic possession, you know, one of those horror films or something, or something that's filled and riddled with witchcrafty whatever. Not for the sake of enjoyment. Don't, Don't hear me and say, oh, God's telling you to watch Harry Potter. You know, no, what I'm saying is there are things that God can use to show example and reveal out of the, out of the very um, uh, imagination. Where do you think Satan got it from? He didn't create that stuff. God did. He's only hijacking it and exposing his own, his own plan by putting all this stuff out pridefully. You know, he's, he's doing that. And so I am not, by the way, saying on Sunday morning, what did you guys learn in church? Well, pastor said that we should watch Harry Potter. It's not what I said. Pastor said, seek the kingdom of God first, right? He'll tell you what you need to do in in everything that you do. I'm only pointing out that those petty details that we sometimes deem petty are massively important, massively important. Um, Yeah, I'm going to close here. I have a whole nother section that would take us to dinner time. So I'm going to do that next Sunday because I really do feel that this needs to simmer. And the next portion, this is all stewardship this morning. Next Sunday, I'm going to talk about kingdom leadership because there's stewardship in how you lead. And that is critically important because every single person here is called to be a leader. And and in fact, I'm going to spoiler alert next week. You're a leader right now, whether you feel like it or not, whether you think it or not, you're a leader of at the bare minimum, you're a leader of yourself. You're a leader of yourself, right? You are called to lead yourself in the stewardship towards the gain of his kingdom. Whether you believe in God or not, that's what you're called to do, right? So you're called to lead yourself. If you're an older sibling, you're called to lead your siblings. If you're a spouse, you're called to lead your spouse, your family. You can lead. Did you know that you can lead this church? Did you know that, that you can lead this church? What I did not say is, did you know that you can hijack Greg's position and take over as lead pastor? That's not what I said. But you can lead this church. Leadership is not about an established position. Leadership is about influence, good or bad. Kingdom influence is about, I mean, kingdom leadership, sorry, I said that wrong. I already revealed the answer. Kingdom leadership is about kingdom influence, positive, godly influence. You know, I'm going to stop there. We're not going to preach till next Sunday. So, <clears throat> really seek God. Really seek God on how to steward your decisions. Really seek the Lord on how to steward what he's given to you. Greg's talked about it a lot. Um, Brooke mentioned it in, I think, after the first worship song, you were, you were just praying and, and, and talking about just even that worship song about how Greg has preached, and, and we've talked about this a lot as a church, about how we are, we, we as a bride are to ready ourselves, 
right? I mean, for those of you who are married or thinking about getting married or wherever you're at with marriage, like as a guy <clears throat> or as a girl, honestly, would like, are you okay with the fact that they show up like an hour late to the, to the, you know, whatever that's called, the ceremonial, the platform, what is that called? To the wedding. <clears throat> show up to their wedding on the wedding day and like, look like they just rolled out of bed like five minutes ago. Oops, I forgot to set an alarm. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, baby. <laughs> I love you. Do you? You can make mistakes. I'm not saying everybody needs to be perfect. But if they really cared, they would have put extra oil in their lamp. If they really cared, they would have given everything they have to ensure that there was a readiness to bestow the honor of themselves as a, be careful here, as a vessel <clears throat> for that person, right? Because it's not about us, it's about him. And that's what we're going to talk about in being a leader in the kingdom. Stewardship is extremely important, and stewardship goes into every aspect of leadership in the kingdom. Leadership in general, but kingdom leadership, kingdom stewardship is, is I mean, a foundation for that. You can't be a good leader without good stewardship. And um, so I'm going to close here. Father, I just thank you so much. Thank you so much, God, for everything for everything that you do for us, God, for everything that you bestow upon us. God, I sit here this morning. I was talking, or Greg was talking with me this morning in the car here, and we just sat in awe of the things that you have given us in ability, research, to think. Our church in Nigeria, as I'm opening my eyes and looking around, our church in Nigeria is larger than this. Our church in Nigeria is larger than this, God, and look at the things that you have done from this very group of people as I'm standing in this room. God, the, the insanity, the insanity of the ability financially that you've given us in, in effect in this ministry, both here and Nigeria, in human resources, connecting us with people that we have no business even talking about, honestly. We don't even have business talking about their name. And yet, they're people that you're introducing us to. People that, that you have even established a, a garnishing of influence over them. And I know I'm being vague, but, but Father, it's, it's unbelievable. It requires the utmost of faith, God. And I, I thank you for all that you do in that way. I thank you for each and every person that is on the team out in Nigeria and each and every person that is here on the, on the team of Ignition, God, and how they do steward the things that they are, that they do have, God. Call us deeper into better stewardship of what you give us, God. Call us deeper to that so that you can prepare us to give us more, so that we can steward more in your kingdom and garnish more influence on others on how to steward more and perpetuate this to the final point of the fact that the entire globe has been stewarded well and that the bride has put on the wedding dress, all the makeup, and been fully prepared more so than what the bridegroom is expecting. How awesome would it be as a bride to shock Jesus and him be so excited and even surprised at the excess we want to pour out to him? What an awesome honor that would be. God, help us to do that. Don't spoil that surprise with him. Bring us to that point for your son to where we do more than he ever expected us to do. God, I just thank you. I praise you. God, and I do again ask that the Holy Spirit just digest with each one of us what needs to be digested. Many of us know many of these principles. They're not all brand new. But God, settle into our spirits what needs to be settled in. God, and I just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.